I started a series on Wednesday. Please, you may sit. I started a series on Wednesday and I called it Supernatural Turnarounds in Finances. Uh, I also want to reiterate that every service of this month will be an extension of the anniversary. Some people are, are too event conscious, but sometimes an event only ushers in a certain experience and certain seasons and certain things. And it's important to ride the surf once the waters are stirred. And all of those five days from the 11th to the 15th, we had the waters constantly stirred, constantly stirred. And we've been teaching in different areas of turnaround. And I also want to encourage you to keep your heart open. As we engage the word of God, keep your heart open. Don't be a selective receiver of the word of God. The people who don't get fully blessed will be people who like one thing God has said, but they don't like another thing God has said. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. God is not a taskmaster. His word is yea and amen. Every time God gives us a command is because there's a blessing to get. Every time God orders your steps is because there is something he wants to do. Enlarge your heart and allow God free course in your life. Let him have the right of way so that you can experience his best in your life. The subject of finance can be, you know, very touchy for some people because every time money is mentioned, someone feels like they have come again. You know, they're about to, they're about to, they're about to. But look, it takes light to enjoy the benefits of God. It takes light. James 1 verse 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift they come from above. They come from God, the Father of lights, in whom is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. It means that there is light for everything you want to enjoy from God. And so even in the area of finance, there is light for us in the kingdom. Let me also put out a caveat. Sometimes when you begin to teach principles of the kingdom, people begin to mention people in the world. What of this one? Is he keeping the covenant? What of that one? Does he pay tight? What of that one? Are we those ones? We are not those ones. When we are talking about covenants in the kingdom and a relationship with God, you are telling us about people who don't know God, who merely either by their labor alone or by some sharp practices that you do not know have climbed to where they are. What's the hope for them? For us, we will be blessed here and in the time to come, we still have eternal life. That is a very big difference. That is a very big difference. For us, let me also tell you that there are the teachings of Jesus. When you look at the teachings of Jesus and teachings in the New Testament, you will see that there are certain things that God will lead us to do with our money that have eternal value. Oh, yes. An example is in Luke 12. Now, this is, I'm just passing, but you see, I always like to lay a good background so we can be on the same page and you can get the 100% understanding on the subject. In Luke 16, for example, from verse, uh, no, Luke 12 from verse 16, that's the story of the man we popularly call the rich fool, right? How that he's, his ground brought forth plentifully and then he began to say, I will break down these barns and build new ones. Okay, God said, that's fine, of course. That's, you know, that is common sense. If you have more harvest than the capacity of your barns, you're going to have big ones. So that's fine. But he also says, I'll say to my soul, eat. Hey, relax. You have arrived. Eat. Drink. You have enough stored up for many years. Yeah, you have, you know. And then the next voice we hear is, thou fool. Thou fool. And it's God speaking to him. Thou fool. He said, today your life will be required of you. And I'll see. These things that you have hoarded and you have kept, I'll see who they will be for. And so we can interpret the heart of God there that God was behind his increase. God will have no moral justification to speak to what he wanted to do with his thing if God was not involved in his increase. We also see a lack of understanding of the purpose of his increase. He thought that increase was just about clothing, designer shoes, food, you know, living large, largessing, and proving a point to others. And God is saying, thou fool. Now, a person is a fool when they lack understanding. It means that what God allows to flow into our lives carries a reason. There's a purpose to kingdom wealth. Kingdom wealth is not just for food and clothes. And I've said a thousand times, you don't need to be wealthy to wear good clothes and eat good food. 
If you have a basic income and you plan properly, you can wear some nice things and you can eat some good food. So for kingdom wealth, there is much more to it. And this man didn't understand it at all. Now in the interpretation of this uh, scenario, Jesus begins to tell them, if you read down to somewhere in verse 21, Jesus says, so is everyone who is not rich unto God. And he's trying to tell us about that man and showing us how that this man was blessed of God but had no plans or no intentions to be useful in the things of God. Praise God. And then he's also teaching them, good, in verse 21, so is he that laid up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is a continuation of that story. Hallelujah. And we find in his teachings where he's telling us to do things that have eternal value. So there are things we do here with our time, with our resources, with our money that can have eternal value. Now back to the other people. Will they have eternal value with their resources? No. Do they have kingdom purpose to their finances? No. Stop comparing yourself to some unbeliever who is prospering because our prosperity and theirs is not the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. I heard David say in one of the Psalms, uh, maybe Psalm 73 or Psalm 75, and he says that, now, he was having a conversation with God and said he was wondering why some of these guys who didn't know God were prospering so much and so on, and that he was bothered. I'm paraphrasing. And then he said, until he understood that, ah, that their feet are set on slippery ground, that for them, anything can just happen, you know? They can go up today, go down tomorrow. Plus, the Bible tells us that the blessing of the Lord make it rich and added no sorrow. There are other people too who seem blessed and are rich, but it's not really the blessing as ours. They are rich, but you will never know their sorrows. Stop desiring what the unbeliever has. Stick with what God has shown you. That's what is sure. That's what is authentic. That's what is sure. I hope that has answered that. And so in the three services today, I'm going to be dealing with uh, supernatural turnarounds in finances. And maybe just to slightly uh, change the topic, I'll just say a financial turnaround. So this can be part one, but it's the same thing. It's a continuation of what I started teaching on Wednesday. God is spirit, and his dealings with us are spiritual. Somebody say, God is spirit, and his dealings with us are spiritual. John 4 verse 24 says, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, we, we, we also see in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 that his blessings are spiritual. His blessings are spiritual. And we understand that we need the knowledge and obedience of spiritual principles to enjoy those blessings. Let's read Ephesians 1 and verse 3. I like the scriptures popping up as fast as possible. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who had blessed us with what? Again with? With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So the blessings are primarily what? Spiritual. We must understand spiritual operations. We must understand spiritual principles to enjoy these blessings. Because when you begin to teach spiritual principles, sometimes on is like, no, no, but the blessing is spiritual. It requires that you have spiritual understanding if you're going to maximize the blessing. Look at the prayer that Paul prayed in Colossians 1 and in verse 9. In Colossians 1, Colossians 1 verse 9. He says, for this cause, since the day that we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all what? Wisdom. And, and, and. So there is a class of understanding called what? Spiritual understanding. This understanding is not logical. It is not taught in philosophy and logic. 
This is not the one that Aristotle and uh, Demosthenes and Descartes and Pluto and Socrates. No, it's, it's not. This is different. This is different. It's called spiritual understanding. So there is logical understanding, which is understanding that comes from the exertion of the human mind. There is spiritual understanding, which is understanding that comes from the illumination of the spirit. It's a different class of understanding. You cannot walk by logical understanding and enjoy spiritual things. No, spiritual things are spiritual. They require spiritual understanding. Somebody say spiritual understanding. Hallelujah. So there are blessings reserved for us that are revealed through spiritual teachings. But those who despise spiritual things cannot benefit. They cannot, they cannot benefit from them. If I were to do a quick ru uh, a run here, it would be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 9 to 15. A very quick one and I'd like us to read it together. I have used this scripture a gazillion times. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and from verse 9 to 15. As quick as we can. Are we there? But as it is written, eye has not seen, uh, ears have not heard. What? Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But they are what? Revealed. Uh, for for <laughs> I was prompting the next four, not the first four. <laughs> okay, let's keep going forward. Even so, but now we've received, but that we may know things that are freely, which things are? But comparing spiritual things. Go on to the next verse. Receive it not for neither they are spiritually descent. Stop. Now, so there are things reserved for us. For the purpose of those watching, this is 1 Corinthians 2 from verse 9 to 15. Okay, so there are things reserved for us. And the Bible says these things are revealed to us by the Spirit of God. Then the Bible goes on to say we have, what? We have the Spirit and this Spirit reveals the things that are freely given to us. Paul goes on to say which things we speak. So the things prepared are talked about. They are talked about. So what he's teaching them is about things that have been reserved. Which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. Again, he's telling them, there are things reserved for you. These things are revealed by the Spirit. We are teaching about them, but they are not logical. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Again, things are reserved, things are revealed, these things are taught, but they are spiritual. Wow. If you catch that, you have caught a lot. Amen. Glory to God. So God wants to be involved in our finances. Haggai 2.8 says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord. I encourage you to get Wednesday's teaching. I'll try not to uh, go too deep into what I taught on Wednesday so I can continue with the teaching. Hallelujah. But to touch one or two points, I said God will never ask you for what you don't have. You cannot go and take a loan to give an offering. You cannot borrow money to give to God. God does not operate like that. God will not ask you for what you do not 
have. However, God will test your faith in giving. God will test your faithfulness. There are people who make a vow before the Lord and God goes ahead of them and does his part and watches whether they'll do their part. But too many times, people begin to have reasons. You know, they become dodgy and they start giving excuses why God understands, you know, and so on. That's why some people never enjoy the covenant because God cannot trust them. The biggest things that God does for us will come out of a covenant relationship. Can God trust you? Can God trust you? The Bible says, he that is faithfully little is faithful in much. God will test your faithfulness to determine your promotion. God will test your faithfulness to determine your establishment and promotion. There are people who have tasted of the good things of God, but they're not established or they've not grown to a new level and measure because they can't be trusted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So covenant practice is the avenue for supernatural involvement in your life. Covenant practice in your finances will bring about supernatural involvement in your finances. In your finances. Giving will always require spiritual understanding and faith. It will require spiritual understanding and faith. And many times it will not make sense. I gave an example of the woman who broke the alabaster box of oil in Mark 14, verse 3 to 9, and how everyone said, what's all this waste for? And she broke that oil and poured it on Jesus. It's amazing how people think that God is not even worth some kind of gesture from us. There are always people watching you who think they can tell you how to serve God with the resources that you have. And you have to be very careful or else you're going to lose your blessing. You're going to lose your blessing. And it's interesting here that the conversation was started by a man who was a thief. But in the ears of all, he sounded religiously correct. Because he said, what is all this waste for? We could have sold this oil and given the money to the poor. But this same account in the book of John, the Bible clearly says, this he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he often took from what was in the bag. So for him, it was a strategy to get them to sell the oil, put money in the purse, and because he held the purse, he would steal from it. He already thought about how much he could steal from it. But in the ears of everyone, it sounded like someone who really loved the poor. Ah, why did they waste this thing on Jesus now? We should have sold it and given the money to the poor. And everyone said, yes, yes, all these people. I don't know what they're doing their money. The poor are dying. And da, 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 da. It is a form of spiritual poverty to always be inter interested in what other people are doing with their finances. We want to know what you're doing with yours. Before you come out and tell someone not to drive a certain car and to take the money to the orphanage, I want to know how many times you've gone there and how much you've given. And by the way, when they go, they don't come to your house to write their names on your attendance. You do not know how God has blessed them to where they are. Mind your business and serve God. Tell your neighbor, mind your business and serve God. That is the truth. It is a form of poverty to always be interested in what other people are doing with their money. You pay attention to yours and allow God to bless you. And when God blesses you, you know, uh, tomorrow and someone gives you a Prado, please sell it and give the money to the orphanage. You know, trek, jump into small buses, you know, and taxis, you know, so that we can know how much you love the poor. Yes, that's, that's going to be a very good place to start. And I'm not saying people haven't sold cars and done that. But I'm saying you do it. Uh -huh. You do it. That's fine. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Your giving must always reflect your current level of blessing. Never give below where God has raised you. You can't be touching millions, hundreds of thousands. You're giving 50 naira as offering, uh, 200 naira, 150. It, no, you just shame God. That is what you're doing. Every time God increases us, he expects more from us. 
every year, I don't even wait for the increase before I press into the increase. I change my offering every year. It's a personal understanding and covenant practice. So from the beginning of the year, I start by changing my offering, trusting that the Lord will bring me to a new place of finances. It has worked for me all the time. So when God increases you, let it reflect in how you do the things that you do. When God increases you, be more participatory. You can't be so blessed and just always fold your arms. There's something to be done. You're not going to do it. We're buying chairs. You don't care. We are doing this. You don't care. You pass and you see something broken in the house of the Lord. You have what it takes to get, you know, you don't care. You just shut your eyes to everything. Why does God have you in his house? Why does God have you in his house? You've never asked. Why is this thing like this? The pictures are divided into three. And it's not a style. It's not a design. Oh, somebody now. You never asked. But you have what it takes to solve a problem. We don't have to pray for everything because God has you there. Oh, somebody. We shouldn't pray for everything because God has you there. Or you come to church, you find a child whose shoes are broken and maybe the parents are really not financially buoyant. You don't need the Holy Spirit to say, my son, my son. Look at that shoe. Son, say father, buy him another shoe. Zataka parataka. Yes, yes, a new shoe. <laughs> For what? You just call the parent of the child and whisper, how much will it cost you to get another shoe? Okay, send me your account number. Oh, you have cash, you give the person. That's how to live. Don't close your eyes to everything, you know? And then you'll be doing big boy in your village community meetings. Donating millions so that they can sing songs and call your name. I don't even know if I'm sweating. <laughs> Looks like spiritual sweat. <laughs> but I'm showing you how to go forward. It might pinch you a little bit, but it's going to help you. Hallelujah. May it be that in your life, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, they will never say, oh, this guy was once successful. We knew him in Calabado's days. You know, ah, he was doing so well, but now hmm, we don't know this life. This life is not fair. You know, and they start using you to, 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 to speak parables. Ah, in this life, eh? hey, now wow, this guy was a big boy. I knew him. May that never be your testimony. In the name of Jesus Christ, may your lot be like Proverbs 4 verse 18 that says the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more. May you be more and more and more. May your story be like the story of Isaac that says the Lord blessed him and he waxed great and became very great and he went forward. May that be your story in the name of Jesus Christ. So give us our receivers. If you want to be a receiver, you must be an active giver. Luke 6 verse 38, give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men. God has assigned men to do business with you, men to favor you, men to give you opportunities, men that will set the pace for certain things that will happen in your life. But one of the ways to activate your men is in your giving, in your giving. Hallelujah. Go back to the message. Um, there are many things we should give for. Give for the work of the, of the Lord or give for the work of God. Give for the work of God. Hallelujah. In the book of Exodus 25 verse 1 and 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. So taking an offering uh, is a biblical principle. Don't be offended when your church has a need and they are taking an offering. In this church, we have principles of engagement. Nobody's under financial pressure to do anything. We don't follow up people in their houses. Have you paid your tithe today? Have you? Okay. I'll write your name here. Sign. <laughs> Nobody will do that. My responsibility as your pastor is to teach you the heart of God, the truth from the word of God, and 
to trust that that word will prosper in your lives. Basically, nobody has to be under pressure. There's no one on a special giving list that, no, unless you have dedicated yourself to be uh, on such or in such a category, nobody puts you there. Hallelujah. So there is no pressure, but this is a principle of the kingdom. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. And what's the beauty about this? This is Exodus 25. In just a few chapters before, God gave them favor with the Egyptians. They were blessed with money. They were blessed. These guys didn't have any money before this time because they were in slavery. And for 430 years, they were in slavery. Nobody earned anything. They beat them, killed them. They, they were under forced labor and hard labor. And in one night, God turned their stories around. They became financially buoyant. They had silver. They had gold. They had clothing. They had things. And then God says, bring me an offering. And yet, he doesn't take it by force. He says, willingly, because he's testing the hearts of the people. Gratitude will always be expressed in generosity. Gratitude will always be expressed in generosity. Gratitude will always be expressed in generosity. Hallelujah. And of course, we find in the New Testament to Paul taking offerings from the churches for the work of the kingdom. Give to the work of God. Give to the work of God. Number two, give first fruits. I'm going to come back and explain these things, you know, later on in other services. Give first fruits. Now, let me also explain that every principle of giving is like a key that grants you access through a certain door. There are experiences that we want to have and God simply gives us the key to unlock the door. So, if I don't give, have I sinned? If I don't give first fruits, have I sinned? No, you haven't sinned. But if I want the blessings that the Bible says that the first fruits open me to, then I must consider this principle. And if I want to be as blessed as I want, then I don't want to pick and choose principles. I want to practice applying them so that I can enjoy God's fullness of blessing. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 11.4, there's a powerful statement, and it's about a man called Abel. Mark that it is recorded in Hebrews 11 verse 4. It has New Testament significance. And this scripture says, by faith, Abel gave unto God, right, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was, what? Righteous. And God... Okay, God testifying of his gifts. We said he did something God was talking about in heaven. God testifying means God kept talking about it to the angels and to the host of heaven. Ah, what kind of thing did Abel do that God was talking about? God testifying of his gifts. And let's see the power of the principle. And by it, he being dead, yet speak it. Wow, so this offering had a voice, a voice that kept speaking long after he died. Look, this is called generational blessing. People know too much about generational curses, curses, curses. There are generational blessings. The man did something. God was talking about it. The Bible also tells us that even after he died, what he did kept speaking. Kept speaking. He kept speaking. There are actions you will take today under the covenant that your great-grandchildren will continue to eat from. Be wise, brother. Be wise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, what he did is found in Genesis 4, verse 3 to 7. Oh, my God. Genesis 4, verse 3 to 7. I can only take another seven or so minutes. But let's see how much we can cover. Genesis chapter number 4. Are we in Genesis 4? Verse 3 to 7. Let's, I'll read very quickly. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. And of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. We don't give offerings anyhow. Give the kind of offering that God can have respect for. I pray that you hear it with your spiritual ears in the name of Jesus. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. He had not respect. And Cain was very wrought. So he gave an offering 
but it didn't reflect the blessing that God had brought upon his life. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Instead of repenting and doing the right thing, he was angry and envious. Verse 6, and the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lie that, at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shall rule over him. Hallelujah. So it was the first fruit that Abel gave that made God talk and it carried a voice long after he died. What's the blessing of the first fruit? There are plenty. Exodus, uh, I believe is uh, no. Ezekiel 44 verse 30. Ezekiel 44 verse 30. Very quickly, are we there? Ezekiel. Amen. 44 verse 30. Uh, verse 30. Ezekiel 44. 30. And the first of all the first fruits of the things and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblations, shall be the priests. Ye shall also give unto the priests the first of your dough. That, now that's my interest there, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. It's a principle that he may cause the blessing to rest. He may cause the blessing to rest. You can taste a blessing that never rests with you. And he said, take it to your pastor. It sounds like, oh yeah, you've come again. That he may cause the blessing to rest. Mm -hmm. I knew it, that we're going to come to this. Take it to him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But should he now come to your house knocking on doors? Well, last did you bring first fruit? <laughs> that is an error. No, that is ungodly, sinful, evil. No, no genuine priest should go about people's houses asking them to bring something, give something, sow something. <laughs> no, no, no. And this is something you do from understanding and willingly. And you don't even do this mechanically so that you can enjoy the blessing. Now, but what is the first fruit? In the New Testament sense, what's the first fruit? I'll just speak generally, and that's going to help you because certain practices in, in the Old Testament have a New Testament dimension of their application. First fruits can be first of something. It can be the first you're earning on a certain kind of job, for example. It can be the, uh, maybe your first month or first in, in a new year. It can be an increase on an ex on an existing job. Maybe I earn 100. Now, I earn 150. 50 is the first fruit. Uh, maybe my, my first month's earnings in a new year. First fruit. There are many different first fruits. For me, I keep my heart open. I don't legalize my first fruits. For example, my own earnings don't come as salary. I can be smart and say, oh, the first profit offering I'm going to receive in the next year, that is my first fruit. Then someone just comes, ah, pastor, I just want to put this little seed in your hands. And then maybe the person gives me 5,000. And that's the very first thing I'm receiving. I say, ah, now the thing where you give me, baba, <laughs> now him way I they bring up. So, and then I'll say, that's my first fruit. I've sorted God, though, this is my first fruit. No, 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 no. Even if it was 50,000 I received, I know that that is not my level for first fruits before the Lord. Do you understand what I... So, I'm not going to pay it and say, hey, Lord, I've sorted you. This is my first fruit. You know? No! You know where God has placed you. And I'm saying that to also help business people. Whether you earned it or not, for me, I usually determine that my first fruit cannot be below a certain mark, you know? And so, as the blessings come, 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 even if it's somewhere, if, if I have the amount at the beginning of, 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 of that year, I would, I would give it. But if I have to wait for two weeks or three weeks to put it together, I will bring it as my first fruit. So, the application in the New Testament requires understanding. Do you understand now? I hope you do. I've said different things. If you earn a salary, maybe it's different. But for people who do business, or for some of us, people like me, I, I, I don't have a salary. I don't receive a salary. 
But I also understand in my heart, there's a certain amount, there's a certain figure that I can't give less than this as my first fruit. And it doesn't matter what the first thing that enters my hand is. I will make sure that I meet a certain mark that I have set in my heart. So I hope that makes sense. So that you don't, and if you're a business person, you may not wait. What if you don't earn that uh, first month or something? You can, you can choose an amount. You can determine and you know how to do it. The Holy Spirit guides us in the applications of principles in the New Testament. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. All. So shall thy barns. Somebody say barns. Notice it didn't say baskets. Deuteronomy 28. Is that verse 4, verse 5? Let's see Deuteronomy 28, verse uh, 5. Verse 5. Let's read it together. Blessed shall be thy and thy two places, right? The basket is smaller and it carries immediate needs. The store is a store. Things it carries bigger and things you don't need. This is the exceeding great abundance dimension. But this scripture shows us how you can minister to your store. There are people who are blessed in their basket but they don't understand the blessing of the store. They've not entered that place where there is a hundred M, ten, five hundred M, one B sitting somewhere that you don't need. Oh, somebody, somebody, somebody. Even a one M just sitting there that you don't need. They've not entered the store. Everything that comes is going to solve an immediate problem. It, you know, they need it now for rent. They need it for shoe. They need it for textbook. They need, they need, 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 need. No matter what comes now, it's going to be swallowed up by a need. That is a level. Yes, he supplies your need, but there is also supply for the store. Someone has got to start positioning themselves for the storehouse dimension of blessing. And look at what he tells us in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the... I want you to read it with me. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy bands be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So one of the ways by which an opening is made for your storehouse to be ministered to is by the principle of the first fruits. So it's not a sin if you don't give it, but if you're eyeing the blessing on the store, this is one of the things that the Bible says you should do. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And this substance, Luke 8 verse 2, did Jesus, did people in the ministry of Jesus, apply these principles? You bet. Look at Luke 8 verse 2. Let's read it together. One to go. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went out seven devils, verse 3, and Joanna, the wife of Shilza, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and, and many others, which ministered to him, of their substance. This is a spiritual principle. People who were blessed came back and blessed him. Hallelujah. And I'm going to be showing you in other areas. So that's where I stopped in the first service. But I'm going to go on and show you about other things that can provoke the blessing. Like giving to the poor. Uh, uh, giving your tithes. Giving to your man of God. Blessings that can, or principles that can provoke financial, the blessing of financial turnarounds. Hallelujah. Amen. I so want to continue, but I so have to stop. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we rise with our offerings as I invite Pastor Kome to bless the offerings? <laughs>